Welcome to Beyond the Beacon with Bishop Kevin Sweeney, a podcast of the Diocese of Patterson. I'm Jay Agnish, Communications Director for the Diocese and Editor of the Beacon Newspaper. With me is Bishop Kevin Sweeney. Bishop, how are you? I'm good, Jay. How are you doing? Doing well, thank you. So, so what's new? I know we're a few days away from... Summer's over, unfortunately. Summer, yes. <laughs> That's, uh, the weather is summer still here, but uh, so... Uh, uh, Labor Day weekend, um, sad weekend for some uh, who may not be happy about going back to school, but mm-hmm. it is back to school, and we're praying for all of our teachers and students and families as uh, this new school year begins. We had a mass yesterday, or on yeah Tuesday, um, yesterday, with uh, our diocesan staff uh, to mass of the Holy Spirit to begin the school year. I did mass this morning at Immaculate Heart of Mary School in Wayne uh, as they bless the new stream room. People might know STEM or STEAM, but they, huh. uh, science, technology, religion, oh. uh, engineering, huh. arts, and math. So they got there it all. Go. <laughs> so <laughs> Father Matt and... Uh, Straight to stream yes, from STEM. Okay. That's right, yes. Uh, so um, so uh, back, to, back to action. And um, my Yankees have won a few games in a row now, so... Oh, they have, uh, okay. They're not completely... They're not math- mathematically eliminated, Good so... Uh, <laughs> we, but uh, <laughs> nice to have college football back last weekend, yeah. and... The NFL coming up uh, with some excitement for Jet fans, and I think now Giant did my, fans as well. My, uh, after last week's podcast, my, my wife's father texted me, hey, the Bishop's a Notre Dame fan. Are you a Notre Dame yeah, fan? Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, okay. It, I think <laughs> it's in the air when it's you're growing up in an Irish household, I think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, Had yes, to ask and, for him. Uh, they're yeah. looking good. Uh, a lot has changed with college football with, uh, wow, some of the changing of players, and now players can get paid for their – Use of the uh, what is it likeness? Um, oh, there's three letters um, yeah. that they use: uh, um, name, image, and likeness. I think nil or something like that. But um, good for them. Uh, w- yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, not sure if it's so good for <laughs> college athletics. But, okay, uh, it, that's been a challenge for many, many years. It's the best way to do it, but um, it certainly brings some excitement. Uh, and uh, yeah, the NFL will do that too. So um, yeah, it's a great great time of year. Um, and okay, so want to introduce our guest today. We have f- with us Father Edward Red- Redding, who is a licensed clinical alcohol and drug counselor. He was ordained a priest in the Diocese of Patterson, but he serves outside the diocese in specialized ministry. Dr. Ed has a clinical practice in Toms River, New Jersey, called the Matt Talbot Institute. He also has a weekend parish assignment at Good Shepherd in Andover. And he's an, a distinguished Catholic Charities board member. He has been an addiction professional since 1969. He's a member of several national, international organizations and has taught addiction studies at the undergraduate, graduate, and doctorate levels. He's also lectured to medical and pastoral professional groups throughout the United States and Canada. Welcome, Father Ed. And it is National Recovery Month. Thanks, Jack. Yeah. Thanks so it's so good to have it. you here. Yes, I'm yes. really looking forward to the conversation. And at first, I'm just going to ask if the bishop could open us up in prayer. Sure. We'll place ourselves in God's presence, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. As we pray today, and in this month in a special way, as we pray for all those who are in recovery, those who may be struggling with addiction, we pray for Father Ed and the, all those who walk the journey with um, those um, asking God's grace in, in the gift of recovery and certainly the healing that can come for individuals and families as part of that experience. And so we give thanks for uh, the graces that God gives us and that gift of healing. And we join all our prayers together as one as we pray as Jesus himself has taught us. Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come, come, thy will will be done done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread bread, and forgive forgive us our trespasses trespasses, as we forgive forgive those who trespass trespass against against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Our Lady, seat of wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I was going to say St. Matt Talbot, but is he, is he no, not yet? No, he's right? only right. venerable. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> Matt Talbot, pray for us also. Right. Right. But they were, uh, when I was there a couple of weeks ago, the pastor of the parish that he's buried in. Uh, Dublin, said, is that right? Yeah, in Dublin. Yeah. Uh, Our Lady of Lourdes Parish. Um, it's a relatively new building, like 1950s. Uh, but he said, you know, 
people in Ireland don't think much of Matt Talbot. People in America have a lot of devotion to Matt Talbot. Right, right, so right, it's right, kind of interesting right. uh, because I was considering running a pilgrimage to his uh, shrine. And he said, no, you don't want to do that. And having spent five days in Dublin with all the drinking going on, I thought, <laughs> no, it's probably not a good idea to bring... <laughs> Lead so us not into temptation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and, and then I talked to one of the people that runs these tours, these pilgrimage tours, and he said, Father, I've got a lot of recovering friends. I wouldn't be caught dead bringing them to Dublin. <laughs> so knock, too, you can go to knock. Too many. Too, yeah, too, yeah. Too, yeah, well, I, I didn't go there, but uh, there, there's enough pubs around there that that would probably be a risk also. So, so now, didn't you, were you just at Mount Talbot's uh, grave site? Uh, yeah. So that was in Ireland. Yeah, I, I was there for a wedding, okay. and I needed a place to say mass on Sunday. So I called the parish and made arrangements that I would come celebrate. I ended up being the main celebrant. And, um, you know, that was a big honor. It was, a yeah. Sil- it was a Salesian parish, and they allowed me to do that and preach and all that sort of thing, which was kind of interesting because I started off the Mass, and I said, by now you can tell I'm not from here. <laughs> and I said... Um, He's a yank. <laughs> I, I said, you're, you're probably not going to understand what I'm saying, and you folks speak so fast that I don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> so let's try to get this over with as best, <laughs> as best we can. You know? And you and, said you got good reviews. And I got very good reviews. Good, good. That's probably because they didn't understand me. <laughs> well, it's um, been a pleasure, Father, getting yeah. to know you over these years as now as in my time here in the diocese. And you can tell us maybe a little bit. At some, so you know you have a long history as... Jay just said in Catholic Charities and, and in our diocese. But maybe uh, since we mentioned his name, uh, and I think I learned something new, um, did you do you say you have, did you found a center or the Matt Talbot? The, the Matt Talbot Institute is something that I founded. Great. Um, and maybe just, uh, um, it's, some may not be familiar with the name Matt Talbot. I, uh, I know he struggled with alcohol himself through much of his life. And did he stop uh, all of a sudden? Or, um, yeah, um, he, he found his recovery when, it, and this was before AA, so right. he didn't have much to work with. Right. He did it by getting back to his spiritual roots mm-hmm. in Catholicism. Right. And when he started sobering up, he also then got involved in social justice issues through the union movement at okay. the time. So it what would, period, the early 1900s? Yeah. Or? Right. Um, and, you know, so he was involved in union movements. He worked in a lumber yard. He was a Catholic? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, very Catholic. And now I'm remembering, and if correct me, uh, Matt Talbot retreats are Matt Talbot popular, retreats right, for are, are those popular in recovery. here, mm-hmm. not so much in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. um, the spirit uh, moves. In yeah. This. One of the big movements, um, and I and I think the pastor there was correct. I think in Ireland he's not as popular, even though that's where he's from. Yeah. But Irish Americans brought his legacy with it. Uh, with right, him. Right. And the Matt Talbot retreat movement is another New Jersey-based thing hmm. where they run uh, retreats, and we, a number of our priests in the diocese and deacons run these retreats. Um, and they're basically for recovering people. They don't talk that much about Matt, but they talk about mostly recovery issues and yeah. spirituality. Spirituality, right, yeah. right, right, right. So maybe... Um, uh, give us a little bit of your own personal history and background in terms of, I think you grew up in the diocese and I, when you were ordained and how you got in, involved in this work that you've yeah. been doing now for throughout your priesthood, I believe. Well, I was baptized a block away from the cathedral. Okay. Yeah. The old St. Boniface Church, which is now a Catholic charities f- Father English. Food, food, yes, food pantry right, right. and all that sort of thing. Uh, so uh, that parish was established in the uh, mid-1800s. And um, from what I understand... I was the first person ever baptized there to be ordained. And then a year after me, Stan Barron, Father Stan Barron, was baptized there. And we are the only two people in the history of that parish to have ever been baptized um, and ordained. So um, they didn't have a good track record for vocations. <laughs> well, two is pretty good. <laughs> I don't know. If, uh, Every, uh, and they two quality. We got quality, <laughs> not quality, you right? Go. So there yourself you and Father Stan are a good combo there. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I, I was born there, raised first four years in the city of Patterson. Uh, okay. My, my grandparents, both my grandparents' houses. Um, then we moved to Totoro Borough, 
in what is now St. James, which is where I did uh, First Communion and Confirmation. I did one year of religious education for each. Um, and uh, then... In public school you were attending, and, right? And I was right, public right, school right, right. and moved to Hawthorne in eighth grade. Um, my parents w- were considering sending me to Catholic school. That They knew nothing about the vocation or anything like that at the time. But I didn't like Catholic school kids, and I would have <laughs> had to go to DePaul, so I opted to stay at Hawthorne High School. Oh, wow. So... Um, we now have a couple of priests in was the diocese. Was priesthood a thought at that time for yourself? Uh, no, not in the, n- not until senior year high school okay. is when I kind of got got the bug a little bit. Yeah, and um, so was not enthusiastic about Catholic stuff. We went again f- one year first communion, one year confirmation. That was it. And then with senior year high school, I started to get the itch, and um, I got led to uh, the diocese and went to Seton Hall. Was for there a particular priest that? Yeah, Father Vince Malatesta. He was in Prospect Park, and we lived in Hawthorne, but we were on the Prospect Park border, so it was easier to get to St. Paul? Paul's than oh, it was okay. to, um, uh, to St. Anthony's. Now you became a deacon I in 71? A deacon in 71. And that's where I was officially signed to full-time ministry at Straight and Narrow. Uh, it wasn't called Straight and Narrow at the time. It was Mount Carmel Guild. Okay. Wow. Um, and uh, that year, Bishop Casey allowed myself to go there and Bob Vitillo to go to Catholic Family Community Services uh, without doing the mandatory one-year parish assignment. Okay. Um, so he kind of— Which um, seminary again were you? I. Uh, I was at Darlington, which oh, is sure, right, Darlington right, right, Seton Hall. Right. Bob had gone to Catholic U. Mm-hmm. So, um, so while in seminary, you were working at Street and Error volunteering? Yeah, I, I started getting involved um, in what they called pastoral experience, which started off as one day a week. Okay. And I, I really got the bug, and I started getting addicted to recovering people. Mm-hmm. And... I like um, that. So I got more and more involved there yeah. and um, was actually living there for a while when, um, when I was still in seminary. I, okay, this, and, is, and, they, and, they, this is self-disclosure to the <laughs> bishop now. I had an apartment in Straight and Narrow while I was in the seminary. Okay. And I commuted to the seminary, and they didn't know that. Those were different days, <laughs> right? And, uh, and it worked out. <laughs> and it worked out. <laughs> right. yeah. And uh, maybe some, the, to give us a little history of Straight and Narrow, because I know coming to the diocese, it's really uh, it, it kind of a trendsetter on the national level, yeah, right? We they, were one of the first in the country. Um, it began in a building that was across the street from the cathedral rectory. It was called the, uh, I believe it was the Association for International Development. It was a a Catholic lay movement group, and they were involved in helping support missions, mostly in South America. Um, And Bill Wall, when he was first assigned, was assigned to the cathedral, and he started dealing with alcoholics because that street corner as it is now, is still a place for street alcoholics to be hanging out. Hmm. And so he developed a model of education for himself where he had to learn about alcoholism among street folk. Wow. And hmm. what he did, and I, I got this firsthand from some of his first clients, okay, um, on his day off, because he, they weren't allowed at the time, priests weren't allowed to have an overnight, so on his day off, he would say the early mass. He would have his black suit, collar, hat, and attache case. He would get on the bus on the corner of Grand Street mm. and go to Port Authority in New York, where he would go into the bathroom, in, into the stall. Yeah. And in his attache case, he had old, smelly clothes. He would change out of his clericals. Wow dress up as a Skid Row bum, huh. put his attache case in a locker, and he would go down to the Bowery where he would hang out with the Skid Row folk. Wow. Yeah, wow. And that's how he learned the culture of the street alcoholic. Yeah. And when he came back home, he was then 
getting an education. He, he, well, he, he got the education on how to relate to the people he was working with. And um, eventually he got the building across the street where he was able to put homeless homeless drunks yeah. um, up overnight. And then in 1955, um, and this is a miracle, he managed to get the money to buy 396 Straight Street, which is still one of the main buildings, which during Prohibition time was actually an illegal brewery. <laughs> um, and he, he got it renovated. And in 1955, the detox unit was licensed as a hospital by the state of New Jersey. It was the first time that a non-general hospital or a non-psychiatric hospital was licensed as a hospital. Oh, wow. And we were licensed as a special hospital for the treatment of alcoholism. And so that was the first time that was the first time that a um, a treatment facility in the United States was officially sanctioned and licensed by a state by a state agency. So it had started in '55, and I guess was getting up and running over those years, and then it was. Not yeah. The, the, you, by the late '60s, you were um, getting involved yourself. Yeah. Well, in, in 1964, they expanded to the treatment of drug addiction. Wow. And then I began in 1969. Um, Bill Wall had died in, in I think, May or June. Uh, Father Charlie Greco, who was only ordained about two years, was put in charge of it. And the reason he was put in charge was he was the only one who knew anything about drugs. Mm -hmm. um, he was a former narcotics police officer from Bergen County, and he got ordained, so they put him in charge. And one day, uh, Bill Wall did not write anything down. Everything... It was in his head, and when he died, everything went with him. And I guess eventually he would, that became his full-time ministry, right? I, that was right. his full-time right. ministry, and he asked me to come down because on one Saturday, he was kind of walking through the place trying to figure out what the schedule was because the schedule wasn't even written down. Mm. And he was walking through on Saturday afternoon, he saw all the addicts sitting in groups of 10 in circles, and they were all talking, and he went over to hear what they were talking about, and Bill Wall had them memorizing the Baltimore Catechism. <laughs> Catholic, Protestant, Jew, <laughs> agnostic, atheist, they were all memorizing the Baltimore Catechism. And so Charlie called me, because I was in seminary, and I was being kind of specially trained during the summers at Catholic U to pick up on religious education for the diocese. So he said, you want to start a program for religious ed for drug addicts? And that's how I started getting involved down there. And um, yeah. I, I kind of never left until 1980. And now it's come full circle. But in between then and, and now, um, can you tell us a little about uh, being a, a worker priest or, or working yeah, outside I, of the diocese? Yeah, as when we I started refer to working it? outside the diocese, that was under Rodimer. Uh, he's the one who kind of officially let me do that. And I was involved in beginning in prevention. Um, where I started, uh, I was the first executive director of a group in Morristown called New Jersey Prevention Incorporated. Um, and then after that, went into the State Medical Society. I was asked to go to there. And we started the first program in the country that had full-time staff to treat uh, addicted doctors, wow. um, alcoholic and addicted doctors. Yeah. Right, right. And I still work for them part-time. That's, that's my paying job. Something to remember, especially in National Recovery Month, that uh, it, it, we're all human beings, no matter the education or the professional level or your bank account. And uh, we, sometimes we think it's just um, those who are struggling who have some of these problems. But we, we can pr quickly learn that it can affect anybody in any stage of life or, or, or situation. Right yeah, there. physicians probably right. have a higher rate of drug addiction uh, than the general population. They're harder to get into treatment, mm. but once in treatment, they recover at a higher rate than almost everybody else. Just to go back, uh, I know you celebrated your 50th anniversary of priestly ordination last year, right? Yeah. And uh, so uh, when you were ordained a priest, what was your first assignment? I, I stayed at Straight and Arrow. I, I was, I, Bishop Casey let me go to Straight and Arrow as a deacon. And I stayed at Straight and Arrow until 1980. So, were you, and were you uh, helping out in the parish on Sundays? Yeah, I, that was one of the things. That was a personal thing for me uh, at the time. That's post-Vatican II when a lot of priests that were involved in special ministry 
were leaving and right. getting married. Right. And my experience with them was they were isolated from the mainstream church. And I didn't want to do that. So um, That Sunday I, worshiping community, right? Yeah, right. I asked Bishop Casey through Ken Lash at the time to make sure that I had a weekend parish assignment. So uh, the first year it was uh, Swartzwood, oh. uh, which was an interesting well, place. Mount Carmel, yes. Yeah, because I didn't know anything about Sussex County. And Ken Lash called me up and said, um, yeah, I found a place for you to go on weekends. It's in Swartzwood. I said, where is Swartzwood? <laughs> he said, do you know where Newton is? I said, yeah. He says, you go to the, to the commons, the square, um, stay on 206, come to the gas station with the big tree and make a left, <laughs> and eventually you'll come to it. And, and you may need those directions because it, GPS is the, that's the one place that I've struggled getting to with GPS. <laughs> yeah, I think if you put Newton in, yeah, right, we're going right. to have to solve that. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of that going on. So um, that was my first, and then uh, and that was really a summer parish. It had a full time priest, but it was really beautiful a summer place. place. Yeah, and at the time there was no rectory. Uh, Lou Bichette was the founding pastor, and he lived in the back corner of the all purpose room. Wow, amazing! And amazing. he had a couch that. I slept on. But uh, following that, I started at St. Teresa's in Patterson because that was a lot closer to Straight and Narrow. Okay. And I stayed there until 1980. And how long have you been helping at uh, Good Shepherd? I started at Good Shepherd in 1980. Wow. Uh, it, there wasn't even a parish there at the time. We wow. were still in the fire hall wow. and that sort of thing. Uh, and so then um, both work and education, um, study and then teaching uh, recovery has become so much a part of um, your ministry, right? And that that worker priest uh, right. identity of um, not the typical priestly quote unquote work, but certainly ministry uh, and and a lot of healing. I'm sure that you've seen yeah, along the well, way. Well, when I spoke with Rodimer about going outside the diocese, he said, "Write something up." So I did it as a ministry of healing of healers. Mm. Um, Huh. And that was the addiction piece, yeah. you know, uh, mostly with physicians at the time. What, what is it about addiction that attracted you to the field to, to study that? And to, and to I just got addicted to recovering people. Yeah. Um, at Straight and Narrow, even while I was in seminary, before I got assigned there, um, I just started to get a spiritual connection with recovering people. Hmm. And my seminary work, uh, papers and theology stuff and all that— hmm. I kept writing papers comparing recovery issues with dogma, with church history and all that. And some of the faculty I found out later on were very concerned that I might have been an alcoholic. <laughs> um, and uh, they, um, they were pretty good with me. They, I got away with a lot of stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Father Ed, uh, somebody maybe finds himself... Um, struggling with alcohol or, uh, or drugs um, um, or have a loved one, uh, what, what, what would you, what words would you offer to them or thoughts or to um, maybe take that step towards asking for help? Or Well, the, the first thing is in our culture, we really don't believe that addiction is a disease. And it really is. And not only is it a disease, but it's a very treatable disease. We know how to treat it. The problem is the stigma. People just do not accept it as something that is good. Mm. Um, they keep thinking that once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic, and that sort of thing. And there is a way of understanding that, that that's somewhat true. But being an active alcoholic doesn't mean always an active alcoholic. That once somebody gets into the healing process, their recovery becomes as progressive as the disease can be. Mm. And, um, you know, people... It's life-changing, right? For, yeah, for people, people who get that. into recovery have a real core change mm. in who they are because no longer is the disease controlling them in their behavior, but recovery begins to do it. Mm. So what people have to know is that the stigma that's out there is just not true that people do and can recover and recover at a much higher rate than other progressive chronic diseases. Other progressive chronic diseases are heart disease, diabetes, right. that sort of right. thing. Right. And 
addiction recovers at a much higher rate than either of those. And um, the uh, the struggle that we face as a society with um, opioids now and fentanyl, um, um, what would be, uh, I, I guess it's just something that we have to continue to struggle with, uh, but it's it's certainly uh, tearing families apart. And yeah, uh, Well, that has to do somewhat with history and somewhat with science. Mm-hmm. Back in the days of Matt Talbot, he was addicted just to alcohol because that was the only drug available to poor people at the time. Right, right. So he dealt with his alcoholism. As time went on, and especially here in the States and especially in New Jersey where we have more pharmaceutical production than any place else in the country, mm. um, you know, people can get addicted to drugs other than alcohol almost as easily as people can get addicted to alcohol. So um, history has changed things. Um, And people do still get addicted to different things. Our definition of addiction has expanded over the years. When I first started, we saw alcoholism as one disease, drug addiction as another disease. Hmm. Now we understand that it's all addiction with just different symptoms. And so the, excuse me, the treatment of... um fentanyl or opioids, uh, similar methods? Very similar, as is gambling addiction, as is sexual addiction, as is work addiction. The the behavioral addictions are now considered part of the diagnosis of addiction. It's no longer just alcohol and drugs. Mm -hmm. And maybe share a little bit about uh, the 12-step program. And I I know that's, um, I'm sure there are other ways that uh, people can uh, heal and, 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 recover from addiction, but I know that the 12-step program has been such a, a, a blessing, right? For Yeah. The um, 12-step program, initially, all of our treatment was based in 12-step recovery. Um, as time went on and science c- continued to pick up on how recovery works, then it started to expand. So not only did we move into drugs other than alcohol and gambling and that sort of thing, but we started to have an understanding that the 12 steps relate to every issue in life. Mm. Um, There are books out there now that talk about 12 steps for people that are not addicted. Mm. Um, (laughs) And certainly a lot of connections with spirituality, right? And and Uh, that's the thing about uh, what 12 steps did for our field. Our field was the first profession that was really um, holistic, right from the beginning, because we included the spirituality found in the 12 steps. The other mental health fields coming out of a Freudian background didn't want to talk about spirituality. Mm. So we were the first ones to really do it. And consequently, the profession evolved that way. Mm. Now, in the official scientific literature, we understand it not just as biopsychosocial disease, but the official literature talks about biopsychosocial spiritual disease, where the first medical diagnosis that includes spirituality in the diagnosis. Oh, wow, that's so interesting. And and consequently, our treatment includes that. Okay. And isn't there a relationship between the founder of the 12-step program, Alcoholics Anonymous, and a Catholic priest, right? Yeah, in in terms of, um, of other myth. (laughs) Uh, everybody thinks uh, AA began in Akron, Ohio. Um, Really a a myth. Um, AA as we know it began in North Jersey, began in our diocese. Uh, Bill Wilson, one of the co-founders of AA, was living in Rockaway, and he was commuting to New York for his job in Wall Street. Okay. And he wrote the big book of AA on the train going from Morristown to New York. Um, The in his early days, he knew he needed a spiritual advisor, and he found Father Ed, who was at a Jesuit at Loyola, and in Morristown, in Morristown, and that's where he got a lot of his insight into the spirituality of recovery. And if you read the steps, there's a very Catholic thread that runs through the whole thing, Mm -hmm. and. What are a couple of... 
the steps? I, well, anything to do with forgiveness yeah. okay. was all based on that. Acceptance. And the importance of asking for forgiveness, a, a, right? And asking right, for right, it. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, and being able to receive it as right. well. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, Father Red, and there's a new biography that just came out on him called Father Red. Um, who Another good Father Ed. Yeah, several people <laughs> sent me copies of it thinking it was about me, but <laughs> not really. Um, but, but not completely <laughs> unrelated either. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, you know, that was a good place, and that was the place where the Matt Talbot retreats actually started. In fact, there's a statue on the grounds of Matt Talbot. At, at uh, the Jesuit at, Retreat House of Morristown. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, yes. bec because that's where Bill initially got his spiritual direction. Um, wow. And the other thing about uh, Bill in the early days of recovery, when Life Magazine did a story on it, uh, all of a sudden, they went from a few groups. Everybody wanted to start an AA group. Mm. So the oldest AA groups in the country were along the train stops going from New York to Morristown and New York to Bayhead, New Jersey, because they were the two train stops. And after work, he would get on the train. He would stop at these towns, yeah. meet with a group of people to wow. start an AA group. Wow. So the oldest groups in New Jersey are along the train stops oh. for the Morristown line and the South Jersey oldest line. groups in the country or the world, I guess, then, yeah. too. Wow. wow. Uh, yeah. A movement of the Holy Spirit, right? I mean... Well, the, the, this is one of those things where we have to remember Tehard had something right when he talked about how evolution happens... Tehard de Chardin, right? Yes, as part theologian. of the yeah. evolution of the human condition. And... You know, the spirit acts not just where the church is, mm -hmm. but the spirit acts where the spirit wants to act. And there's an openness. And if you if you're open and with alcoholics in those early days, these were people who gave up on everything. They had no place else to turn and except And that word to God. surrender, right? To uh, the higher power. Total yeah. surrender right, to right, the higher power. Right, right, yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's thank God, um, uh, think of how widespread it is today and, and how much healing happens. Yeah, and another little historical shtick at the time, Bill Wilson was actually studying to, be, to convert to Catholicism. Um, the, uh, the person that was teaching him Catholicism uh, was a priest, Monsignor, named Fulton Sheen. Oh, wow. And uh, in the course of the study, he was about to get baptized, yeah. uh, not baptized, received into the church. Yeah. And he decided not to because in talking about it with his AA friends, they said, if you become Catholic, that will reinforce the myth that alcoholics and Catholics are the same thing. Oh boy. Hmm. So he opted not to formally convert. But again, if you read the writings... Yeah. They're so entwined with Catholic spirituality. Right. Um, so uh, Fulton Sheen supposedly said um, that Bill Wilson was the only failure he ever had in, <laughs> in conversion. conversion. Yeah. Uh, Catholic, uh, Catholic charities in our diocese, such an incredible blessing, straight and narrow. Uh, it, am I remembering correctly that uh, somebody got a, a street name changed from uh, to narrow? So yeah, that it, yeah. And I don't think the phrase is used as much as it used to be to go back on the straight and narrow, right? Right. But, uh, it, um, uh. It, the, the, the phrase was there, and Bill Wall, it was on Straight Street, but there was a street, an intersecting street called Cedar Street. And the part of Cedar Street between Straight Street and the dead end at the back of the property, Bill had that changed to Narrow Street. And then that became straight the corner of Straight and Narrow. Right, right. Um, and uh, then DPD and family services. And just uh, maybe to talk about uh, your, ex uh, your experience on the board and, and what you've seen, um, especially um, in these recent years, as under Bishop Salaritelli the and, and Scott Milliken the and Monsignor Tillier, um, how the, the, the board has come together as one board and uh, some of the maybe the history at the, the beginning and, and, and some of the more recent history. Yeah, maybe. there was a there was a kind of a movement. They, each of the agencies got started by charismatic priests. Well, Jack uh, Worland. Jack right? Worland with DPD, and Jack is a longtime friend of mine. Um, he, he, he was with DPD. Uh, Bill Wall, Charlie Greco were straight and narrow. Uh, Monsignor Shanley was 
the first director of Catholic Charities, and then Joe Champaglia took over mm. uh, from him. So we, we really had three free-flowing, freestanding agencies. In order for the diocese not to be liable for everything, each one formed a separate not-for-profit corporation, the and, they, and they evolved that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, under Saratelli, there was a move to bring them together under, under one Catholic Charities. I, there was a lot of people holding back on that. Mm. Um, I think probably within the first year of the combined agencies, we saw that the staffs of all three agencies, when we had our first major staff meeting like that, even the staff liked the idea of getting together. Oh, yeah. So uh, now we've got, we still have the three agencies. They still have their own funding sources and that sort of thing. But we've combined a lot in the central office so that we no longer have three separate bookkeeping departments. Okay. We no longer have three separate fundraising departments. We, I, we have a combined uh, corporate identity as well as the, um, the individual agencies that have the mission. And that also says that if people make a donation to the, any of those individual agencies, when people look where the money goes, it's like over 80% goes directly to client mm -hmm. services. Right, 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 so right. It, like we, we're not paying a whole lot to fundraising and all that sort of thing, mm -hmm, even mm -hmm. though we have it. The money's going where it should be going, yeah. I guess. Awesome. I, um, you know, I wanted to pick your brain a little bit on um, something i um, been reading a lot about lately is the use of hallucinogenics for in therapy is that yeah. like uh, yeah, any thoughts on that any any um, lecturing you've done uh, on that a, or? a lot of mixed thoughts on that okay um or is I it still developing well it's still developing okay um it's happening in, in a lot of places where it's it's legal and legit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um uh portugal and oregon have gone into legalizing to decriminalizing everything hmm. so these are the places where it's mostly being done okay um I know people, even when it was not legal, who were using hallucinogenics to try to recover from alcoholism and that sort of thing. Um, again, going back to Will, Bill Wilson, part of the myth of Bill Wilson that nobody recalls was he tried to understand recovery by the use of LSD oh when he was in Connecticut. Wow. Huh. Um, now, he never made it with that, but... He he thought that there was a potential for using drugs to treat alcoholism. Okay. Okay. Now the AA community still doesn't want to hear that, but it's there in history. Yeah. Um, so there's well, there is there the, is some uh, for um, I guess heroin addicts. I believe there's a, a drug that's used to help them yeah. come off that yeah. addiction, and for opioids, we, same thing. Yeah, we've got a lot of uh, medications used to help people get off other drugs. Okay. okay. Um, I, in fact, I dug up, I'm a bit of a history bug too, I picked up a book published in, uh, 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 in to 1919 um, on the treatment of diseases, two-volume work. And the word addiction wasn't there because they didn't use the word addiction back then. Um, they were habits. And in the treatment of habits, it was listed under diseases of men, <laughs> okay? And they gave some of the detox protocols at the time, which were not too far off from what we do now. Mm. It was kind of a tapering off and that sort of thing. Oh, okay. And in the early days of AA, AA members would detox people at home because hospitals weren't always working. Mm. And they would do it by giving them controlling the alcohol intake and not letting them go into convulsions. So that was happening there. We, we actually saw the use of medical marijuana as the beginning of this change. Huh. So once medical marijuana started to be used as treatment for some legitimate disease, that's when the hallucinogenic crowd began to pick up. Saw their opportunity. Uh, yeah. Gotcha. So, um, and, and again, pharmacologically, Marijuana, everybody thinks, is a, sed a sedative drug. Uh -huh. It's really not. Technically, it's a hallucinogenic. It's a very mild hallucinogenic. Oh, okay. So, um, you know, we need to be careful how we use it. 
I think more people are using it for things that probably they shouldn't be using yeah. it for. Every, every state has a different list sure. of what it's used for. But uh, in New Jersey, we have medical marijuana use, um, but it's still illegal federally. Okay. And that's a problem. Uh, we need to get it decriminalized from the federal system mm. so that they can do good research. Because right now you can't do good research because okay. you can't federally get the researchable marijuana. Gotcha. Um, because it's technically illegal. Okay, good. Well, I don't want to take us too far down this rabbit hole, but <laughs> lots, to, lots we could talk Maybe about, to change sure, one th subject a little bit. Uh, when I first arrived, Father Ed reached out to me by email and told me about a, a group of the priests of our diocese who are not living in the diocese, uh, and I think they might have a name. Is uh, the, we, I went to visit them at least once. Yeah, uh, we um, group of Ocean and Monmouth County, mostly uh, retired priests, uh, we try to get together. In fact, I'm going to be sending out an email this week to set up another date. We try to get together. It was once a month, but COVID kind of messed that up um, for a monthly dinner. A retired priest uh, who are it, living yeah, in it, the it's, shore it's area. Yeah, it's retired right. priest. Right. And uh, the name that we gave ourselves <laughs> was OPA, O-P-P-A. Old Patterson Priest Association. <laughs> and, um, I had a great visit with yeah. them early on. Is there there's 8, 10, 12? Yeah, yeah we, we still get, even though several have died now, we, we still get about 10 or 12 people uh, every month. Uh, one comes from Pennsylvania, Father Pete Duty, um, but everybody else is basically the Jersey Shore area. And you guys uh, are providing uh, some help to our neighboring diocese, I think, as well. Saying yeah, mo right. most of us have some weekend work that we do in, in the Trenton Diocese. Um, and, uh, you know, I still travel up to Andover for one or two masses a month and do Trenton when I can and that sort of thing. And uh, just maybe then a word about your uh, teaching experience. Uh, it, uh, you're at a, one of the local colleges. Y yeah, right? I first started teaching addictions Right after I left Straight and Narrow, I was asked to teach an undergraduate course at William Patterson, mm -hmm. which was an interesting thing because William Patterson at the time was just beginning to teach teachers about alcohol and drugs, and they asked me to teach it. Uh, that was the good news. The bad news was the course was given on Thursday morning at 7.30. <laughs> That's not the bad part. The bad part is Wednesday night was pub night. <laughs> so I was teaching people with hangovers <laughs> in, in the morning, <laughs> uh, which was a difficult thing. But that was my first experience teaching, teaching college. Um, and at the time, there was nobody teaching. There, there was no clinic, people with clinical experience teaching college courses. Hmm. Um, when was this? Uh, what years uh, was this would have been 79, 80. Okay. So um, the only one was actually George, Dr. George Gubar, who was a psychologist at Straight and Narrow. He taught in the psychology department at, at Seton Hall, uh, but he was the only one. And um, because of my preaching background, I had a style of communication that transferred very nicely over into classroom. Hmm. So I started teaching college courses because nobody else was teaching it. I consider myself a make-believe academic. <laughs> um, I wasn't trained. I've never took a teaching course in my life, but I'm apparently good at it. And um, I eventually started teaching at a few places as an adjunct. Yeah. Um, and you're still doing it. And, and I'm still doing it. I've gotten to the point now where I design programs for colleges. I'm involved nationally in the accreditation process for addiction studies programs. I'm currently president of a group called InCase, which is – International Association of uh, Addiction Educators uh, throughout the world. So we're all college and university faculty that teach addiction studies. So okay. I get involved with a lot of that kind of stuff as well. Is there, and I um, was watching one of your lectures that you have a few lectures available on our Catholic Charities website. Um, yeah, you're definitely a great speaker and uh, very insightful. I wonder if there's anything... Um, you you'd want to share with our audience about uh, I don't know the state of addiction or, or something that we might be missing or something that we should be mindful of. So how can we learn more? Or where where are this where's this all going? Well, if it, um, 
I wasn't going to bring this up, but since you brought it up, those three lectures that are on Catholic Charities' website um, is a good way to get an overview of the current understanding of addiction, okay. as well as the family dynamics that go on with addiction. Mm, treatment. And, and adolescence. Okay. I'll put some links to the, yeah. in the show notes yeah, right, right, to those. Right. Yeah, it's great. And if, uh, if someone's looking for help? Um, basically, any licensed treatment program in New Jersey uh, is a good place to start. Um, a well, certainly uh, straight and narrow, they can contact through they, the they Catholic can, Charities They can definitely uh, website, do straight right? and narrow. Yeah. Uh, the difficult thing now is that corporate treatment centers have taken over the field. So a lot of places will not accept you unless you have the right insurance. Uh, straight and narrow will accept anyone. Okay. So okay. Uh, for detox, they'll detox from any drug, and they'll use whatever insurance you have. Or if you don't have the right insurance, they can probably get you some kind of insurance that will help pay for it. So uh, straight and narrow is kind of out in the forefront of that. Mm -hmm. In terms of dealing with the poor, uh, even though addiction affects the poor a lot more than it does other people, Mm -hmm. um, people, again, stigma. Uh, We need to get past it and let people find recovery and that means that they're going to find it in places where they normally wouldn't go. No. Most people aren't going to feel comfortable going to downtown Patterson for healing. Mm-hmm. But this is it, it's an all-time program. It's got long-term stability. Yeah. We're in process of putting up a whole new building, which is right. going to make it right. look a whole right. lot better. Right. Um, and uh, I'm sure some incredibly wonderful people. I know. Uh, the people that work there, right? Oh, and yeah. You know, uh, whether it be the administration or counselors, or uh, God bless them. Yeah, for, we've got really good people down there. They're committed to recovery. Um, they're they're obviously not there to make money <laughs> because Catholic Charities does not pay a whole lot more. We, we Catholic Charities staff pays well below the going rate okay. of the for profit corporations. Well, I know there's some who have themselves recovered from addiction who are working there. We had a story in the Beacon not too long ago right. about Michael Jackson, yeah. who's, who's one of these amazing yeah. stories of recovery. Yeah, and you just have to get the right Michael Jackson. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> yeah, it, this, is, this is a field. Now, I chair the licensing board in New Jersey for this, too. And we have the most applicants that have a criminal history mm. of all the social workers, psychology, medicine, yeah. all that – we have the most because most of our counselor applicants come out of an addiction background. Most of them grew up at a time when use of the drug was illegal, regardless of how you got it. So most of our counselors have a criminal history background, uh, more than half probably. So um, yeah, they when people recover from addiction, their criminal behavior stops. Mm. Forgiveness. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, good. Um, well, this has been a fascinating conversation. Um, I wonder, if Bishop, do you have any final questions for uh, Father Just to or? thank you for uh, what you're doing and um, asking everyone to pray for yourself and those who, who work with you and in this um, ministry, really, of healing uh, that gives us great hope. And uh, it's so good to see you um, going strong uh, 51, 50 years into the priesthood now, right? And uh, and, and still has that, that, that uh, energy and, and enthusiasm and uh, you know, you've been great to me and, uh, and, and helpful in, in so many ways. So, so thank you and, and keep up the good work. And mm-hmm. uh, thanks, I think, for it's uh, important. Uh, you reminded me, I remember last year, that September is recovery, uh, National Recovery Month. So we need to let that be known and, uh, and get the information yeah. out there. And as a sideline to that, it's also Suicide Prevention Month. Okay. And they kind of go together. Right, right, absolutely, yes. Yeah, and it's also Hispanic Heritage Month. There we so go. It's a lot right. And it's National this Banana Month. month. <laughs> self, self, <laughs> care, self Care Awareness Month. I've heard, I've heard all kinds of things, but yeah, no, it's um, a great topic, and we're going to have more on Beyond the Beacon coming up in a couple weeks. We'll, we'll revisit this this uh, topic, and uh, thanks again, Father Ed, for joining us. Um, and Bishop, before we wind down, conclude this episode of Beyond the Beacon, is there anything else you'd like to to share? Um, we can uh, mention it uh, next week, but actually uh, this coming Monday um, is the anniversary of the terrorist attacks of September 11th, 2001. It's hard to believe it's going to be 22 years since that day, and um, 
So um, continue to pray for our country and pray for peace and, and recognize um, those first responders and heroes who's put on those uniforms of firefighters and police officers and those who work uh, in the medical field, um, um, how we need to recognize them every day, not only in the, in the worst moments when they shine as they did on that day. And, um, so, um, and, and to continue to pray for our country, uh, um, our leaders and, um, and, and, and for peace. And so, um, so we, sh we shouldn't let that day go by without, um, you know, just pausing to, to remember, um, and give thanks for those who laid down their lives on that mm -hmm. day and, um, and saved thousands because of, um, their heroism. So, um, um, uh, Father Michael Judge, I, um, the first one to die, the firefighter chaplain, uh, only I realize now he's a strong connection to our diocese. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so, um, I was at St. Mary's in Pompton Lakes a few weeks ago for the ordaining two deacons and so many of the Franciscans were there and, uh, um, yeah. I know he has a long history. So, uh, so we have a lot to be grateful for and a lot to pray for. And, uh, so, um, we'll certainly do that this weekend and, and on Monday on September 11th. Yeah, and check, yeah, check out the bishop's recent column in this week's Beacon uh, about about that. And uh, yeah, it was a uh, wonderful column and we should never forget. That's right. Um, okay, well, um, thank you for spending time with us. Join us again for the next episode of Beyond the Beacon. Please subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening. Give us a positive rating, write a review. And if you're watching this episode on Bishop Kevin Sweeney's YouTube channel, be sure to like the episode, follow the channel, and ring the bell for notifications. Email questions and podcast topic ideas for the bishop to beyond at pattersondiocese.org. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Beacon. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. <laughs>